Thank you so much. And thanks all of you for being here today. And thank you, Masha Gessen. Thank it's you wonderful to have you at the festival. Uh, so I want to start with a fairly simple question and ask you about how you came to write this book, which is a meticulously researched um, deep dive into the, the family history behind the brothers, um, but covers so much other ground, um, the state of affairs in Russia, American foreign policy, all manner of things. So what compelled you to write this book? How did it start for you? Thank you. Um, so at the time of the Boston Marathon bombing in April 2013, I was actually, strangely and briefly, director of the Russian Service for Radio Liberty, stationed in Moscow. And um, when we learned that um, the, uh, the, the brothers, the, the, the suspects were Chechen, our service had to uh, swing into gear. And the Radio Liberty has 28 different language services, so it was a huge operation. I was coordinating the coverage. Uh, and that's pretty much all I was thinking about, was how to coordinate our reporters and get, uh, gathering information about this. And then a couple of days later, um, I was getting off a flight in the US, and I got a phone call from my oldest friend in the world. Uh, we were friends when we were kids in Moscow, then we were friends when we were teenagers in Boston as immigrants, and then we were friends again when we both moved back to Moscow. And so she called me and she said, so you're not returning my, call, uh, my messages, uh, and I wasn't because I was busy with the coverage. So I'm calling you myself to tell you that you have to drop everything and write a book about the Boston bombers. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> because at the moment she said it was obvious. Um, and, um, and the reason it was obvious was because I'd, um, uh, it was a story that was tailor-made for me. Uh, I'd been a teenage Russian-speaking immigrant in the Boston area. Uh, and, and that's important. I mean, it's, it's obviously very important to know, sort of understand the immigrant experience, but I think the immigrant experience is different in different places. There are a lot of universals. But it's also, I think, really important to sort of have a physical sense of the place that you're writing about, um, which I very much did. I'd also covered both wars in Chechnya. And I'd studied terrorism. Uh, as, as, as an Neiman Fellow at Harvard, I, uh, my, my, my topic was terrorism, so I'd, I'd, I'd done some academic study on it. And um, so everything seemed to come together in this project. And so for that blessed moment, which always happens before you start writing a book, it yeah. seemed <laughs> obvious and easy. Yeah. <laughs> and how long did that last? Because this does not seem oh, like it was an easy book to report. About four days. Yeah. <laughs> So how did you go about it? I mean, given those connections that you had, um, you know, whether those turned out to be useful connections or not, how did you start? So uh, in some ways, it was the, the, actually the most difficult book I've ever reported. Uh, and considering that I've written a, a biography of Putin and, uh, and a book about the reclusive mathematician Grigory Perelman, who, who solved the Poincaré conjecture, and disappeared, I, I've reported some pretty difficult books. Um, but what happened with this book uh, is that some of the people that I wanted to talk to, that I needed to talk to, had had the worst possible things that can happen to a source happen to them, uh, the two worst possible things. And these are when private people become suddenly and sort of catastrophically public. Uh, it's always a very traumatic experience. It's not easy to be a public person. Some, some of us get a high off of it. Most people don't. Most people actually find it extremely difficult. They feel overexposed. They feel mis misrepresented. And, um, and that had happened to classmates, uh, in, uh, neighbors, uh, the neighbors of victims, the neighbors of, uh, uh, of friends, uh, because the Boston Press Corps had done a terrific job. I mean, the Boston reporters have done an amazing job on the Boston part of that story, and they were on it from the beginning. And so even, even within the space of a few weeks, which is when I started reporting, people had, had, had experienced the trauma of, of being overexposed. And then the other thing that, had happened, uh, that was happening was that people were being harassed by the FBI. Mm -hmm. And when I say harassed, I mean harassed. You know, um, there are a half dozen Chechen families in the Boston area most of them, I think, were subjected to what the FBI calls overt surveillance, which is when you have an FBI agent in your face, 
24 hours a day. And the purpose of that appears to be solely to let you know that you are being watched. It's an incredibly unsettling experience, and it is doubly and triply unsettling for people who have fled that sort of thing, for whom, you know, it's a life-shaping trauma. Right. Uh, so people had had their neighbors, uh, their, 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 uh, their, you know, the woman had had her son, her young son, led out of their apartment by FBI agents for interrogation, which felt exactly like having her older son led out of their house in Chechnya 15 years earlier, and he had never returned. You know, so people had, had felt that sort of thing. So they were understandably extremely reluctant to talk to me, plus those of them who were in touch with the defense team were being told by the defense team, just please stay quiet, uh, which I think is perfectly justified, but of course it wasn't in my interest. So that was the awful part of reporting, <laughs> and that just took a lot of patience, a lot of perseverance, and a lot of ingenuity to sort of try to come at people from different angles and come to different agreements with people, like, let's not see each other, let's just correspond. Uh, and if you're not comfortable answering questions, just write to me what you want to write, what you want to say, and that way you're controlling the conversation completely, and that worked. Um, and then I also had incredibly lucky breaks that I never could have predicted, like, um, the, uh, the family is actually from a very small town in Kyrgyzstan, in Central Asia, called Tokmok. And there is a Chechen community in Kyrgyzstan. And during one of my speaking engagements, completely unrelated, I happened to meet a team of geographers at the University of Colorado in Boulder who had been doing field work in the Chechen community in Tokmok. So I was in. Uh, uh, and with, with those kinds of closed communities, you're either out or you're in. When you're in, you're in. And everybody will talk to you and everybody will be very open. And that's what happened in Tokmok. And that was just like, unbelievably gratifying to report. Um, did you start by going to Kyrgyzstan, to, to Dagestan, to the place where the family was from? Like you said, that the Boston reporters had done a great job about the Boston part of the story. So did you immediately start? I actually started by going to Dagestan. My thinking was that, uh, the, yes, the Boston reporters had overexposed people and I probably wasn't going to get anything immediately on, uh, in their footsteps. But Dagestan, was, there was a lot of, there were a lot of sort of leads to follow in Dagestan. Dagestan was where uh, the older brother had spent six months in the year before he started organizing the bombing. And it, the, the family was also partly from there. It was a very important place for the family. So, and, I, and, I, and I went to Chechnya, where there were a lot of relatives. I got a little bit of luck in Chechnya. My first two trips to Dagestan were the most miserable, fruitless trips I'd ever taken. And, uh, and there, you know, I wasn't the only one in that situation. A, a good friend of mine, who was a Boston reporter, uh, actually camped out in Dagestan for like uh, weeks, waiting for the family to talk to him. And so I was in Dagestan, I would be exchanging text messages from Zubidat, the mother, uh, with Zubidat, the mother, and she would be texting me amazing stuff. Some of that I actually used, but she refused to see. And then when I got back to Moscow, she started talking to me on the phone. <laughs> uh, and I, I didn't have to, uh, I mean, I don't mind traveling. Dagestan is not a place that's, uh, uh, that's high on my list of places to visit ever again. <laughs> Uh, and then I'd, uh, a year later, I went to Dagestan again. So I took two trips uh, in the summer of 2013, uh, spring and summer. Nothing happened. A year later, I went to Dagestan. Somehow, I'd done somewhat better research. I'd prepared a little better. Uh, or maybe I just had better connections, so it felt like I was better prepared. It was very fruitful. I spent three days there, and I got a lot of material that I had failed to get a year earlier. I wish it had felt like more of a linear thing where it would, I felt like I was... So laying the foundation and making progress. Right. Instead, you're just sort of circling this right. story. And right. then I liked it. And what, I mean, maybe this is really obvious, but what did you want to find out? I mean, what was driving you? I mean, you have all these connections in terms of your own personal experience and professional experience. You end up with connections to the actual, the places where you need to go to report. But what was the question that was driving you? Were you, what, what happened? Why did this happen? Was So I had, I think when you start a book, you always have a working hypothesis, right? or, or as when you start any research project. 
and then it's either born out, which is gratifying, or mm -hmm. it's totally, it turns out to be totally false. Uh, and then you hope that there's another sort of theory that, uh, that, that you can postulate and, and improve. Um, in this particular case, actually, I think my working hypothesis was born out. Uh, and what it was was that this was going to be a small story. Right? So the initial reaction in this, uh, uh, it, uh, to the case, to the bombing, was that it had to be uh, a part of a large conspiracy. There had to be many other people involved. There had to be some sort of story about how Tom Alon went to Dagestan and was radicalized there and became part of something huge. And my hypothesis, uh, from knowing a little bit more than I think many people, but not, not a whole lot uh, about sort of the way terrorism works, uh, my hypothesis was that the, the something bigger was going to turn out to be imaginary. Uh, it's, there is something bigger, but it's virtual. It's, it's a cloud. Um, and in this particular case, it's really virtual. They had no connection to anyone that we can identify. Uh, they imagined that they had a connection. And that it's, it's sort of the, an imagined community in its purest sense. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the, sort of the international terrorism uh, community. And um, uh, so it's a very strange thing to, 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 to decide to do, right? write a book to prove that it's a small story. <laughs> um, but that was the idea that I, I thought I would I could detail it uh, in such a way that 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 I could show that nothing extraordinary happened. Right, but you say I mean, and nothing extraordinary happened. But that makes it, and I'm quoting from the book. It was the hardest and most frightening kind of story to believe. Right. Yes, I think that uh, I mean the way terrorism works is that it shows that something awful can happen to anybody at any time. I mean, terror, terrorism engenders terror, and that's how it engenders terror. Right? And so with any kind of terror, and this includes state terror, which is something that I've written a lot about, right? uh, a natural impulse is try to find a logical explanation. Because random terror is the scariest thing mm -hmm. you can possibly imagine. So uh, actually, uh, imagining a huge conspiracy that recruits people and radicalizes them is much more comfortable than imagining that your neighbor could just be sort of working through his own logical processes and his life experiences that are different from yours, but not so different that you're uh, aliens to each other. Um, he, he comes to the logical conclusion that this is the, the thing to do. And he's not sick, and he doesn't have a traumatic brain injury. Uh, these are some of the... Uh, explanations that have been floated that Tom Alon, as a boxer had a traumatic brain injury and also that he was schizophrenic. None of that, he's normal. And this is what he has decided to do. And that means it could happen again, anywhere. And the war on terror, which targets this imaginary huge thing and is based on this, uh, really, this narrative of radicalization that is not supported by any research, that war and terror is not going to do anything to prevent this happening, this from happening again. That's a very scary thing to think about. So it's a small story, but it kind of unravels a vast structure that we've built up around the idea of terrorism. That's the hope. Well, <laughs> what did you come to believe? So if it's a, a hard story to believe, what did you come to believe about the brothers' motivations, about Tamerlan and Jakar? So what I came to believe is actually uh, exactly this, that um, there is, uh, there's a huge temptation to, to uh, terrorism. And uh, the temptation is, say you were a nobody. Right? And so, the, the, so the, here's what we know, uh, really know, about people who become terrorists. Uh, there's there's a, a great anthropologist who uh, named Scott Atron, who's interviewed many people who are either former jihadists or current jihadis or, 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 or future jihadists. And, um, and what he says is that uh, the, the, the general profile is they come from an immigrant community. They do not have a deep religious background. They, they usually have a secular education, often an engineer or the sciences. They're distinguishing characters. Uh, they're middle class, but usually downwardly mobile. Uh, their distinguishing characteristic is that they have a very small social circle. Mm -hmm. 
Right? So everything happens in this one social circle. The, the most interactions, marriages, uh, socializing. Most of this is uh, exactly true about the Tornado Brothers. It's also exactly true about the many terrorist attacks that have, uh, have happened since the Boston uh, bombing in, in Europe and in Australia. Right? Uh, and um, other researchers also add that there is a high tolerance for, for violence and risk in these people. Well, that all of that obviously describes millions of people. Right? Uh, and if you add that maybe they're incredibly disaffected and, 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 and have had unusually bad luck, which is also true of the Sardana brothers, okay, that's true of hundreds of thousands of people. So, um, so what happens next? I think what happens next is that you are this nobody, this loser. As an immigrant, you feel your nobodiness perhaps more acutely than anybody else because you have a relationship with the state that you've come to. Uh, and that relationship is humiliating to you. And, um, and you have a chance to suddenly become somebody. It's a shortcut. It's a shortcut to greatness, and it's a shortcut to belonging. So it gives you both things at the same time. And you can not only become somebody, but you can declare war on a great power. And then what I think happens next is really scary and really deserves discussion, which is that the great power accepts your declaration of war. Instead of treating you as a common criminal, instead of saying, you did something really horrible. You killed three people and named 264 others. This is a crime against 267 people. It says you attacked the United States of America. You committed a crime against this country and the city of Boston. Which is very much the rhetoric that surrounds it in the media and the rhetoric that, uh, that actually drove the prosecution. Right? The prosecutor said to, uh, uh, to the jury, this is a political crime. Right? And what I think we should be saying is, this is a common crime. Right? This, is, this is a horrible crime. It's murder. We have laws against murder. They're pretty strict. Um, but do not accept the declaration of war and do not wage a war against this thing, this unquantifiable thing, this horrible war that's, um, that's basically, that was waged against an emotion, the war on terror, uh, and that has no clear objection. Because that only serves to, to further the aggrandizement of this crime. Um. To what extent then, I mean, do you say, you talk about this, in, this whole framework in the book about the kind of post 9-11 wor world and that the ideas of terror and terrorism that kind of come into, kick into place as you've just said now in Boston. So to what extent then do you think foreign policy, American foreign policy plays a role in the story, in the brother's story? It plays some role in the story. Um, they had some knowledge of American uh, foreign policy. They certainly were engaged with the whole rhetoric of they're killing Muslim civilians. Uh, they are, I mean, the, the, the only twist in their case on this uh, rhetoric was also that they're in cahoots with Russia, which is uh, killing mu Muslim civilians in the North Caucasus. Factually, this is absolutely true. You know, mm -hmm. at, right after 9-11, the United States basically dropped its criticism of Russia's actions in the North Caucasus and ref uh, allowed Russia to reframe its, its war in Chechnya and in other North Caucasian republics uh, as part of the global war on terror. Uh, and that's, uh, I think that felt very much like a betrayal. So it dovetails with, with, the, with the rhetoric that we're uh, more accustomed to. But other rhetoric would have worked. I mean, uh, Tamerlan Tsarnaev was an avid reader of far right-wing conspira conspiracy-driven publications. Uh, and, um, and this is something, I mean, I'm not the only person writing about this, this uh, the, the woman who wrote a book about Breivik, which was recently translated into English, the Breivik, the, the Norwegian uh, shooter. Uh, she's very articulate on, on the subject of uh, the fact that the, 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 the line between uh, sort of the, the angry white man, right-wing extremist, uh, and the Islamic terrorist, which in, in the FBI's, minds are two, uh, FBI's mind are two 
distinct categories that need to be investigated in different ways. Right? That line is actually very blurry. Uh, and in that particular case, any kind of political foundation could have served the purpose. You know, it's interesting, conspiracy, you talk about how in the, in the sort of in, the, in this vacuum, right, of not knowing really what happened or, well, we know what happened, but why it happened, right? And um, there's a, Jahar, when he's found in that boat, has written on the side of the boat sort of some thoughts. And one of the things that he says is, you know, God has a plan for everyone, and my purpose is to shed light on our actions, right? which he doesn't ultimately do, I mean, or is not able to do in terms of the way he's, he's prosecuted. We don't really understand what the larger narrative is that they were following. But a lot of conspiracy theories have sprung up, and you read a lot about those at the end of the book. There's conspiracies around um, the Russian secret police, the FSB. There are conspiracies around the FBI. What truth do those conspiracies have? Uh, well, the, the simple answer is we don't know. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, the thing about conspiracy theories is that uh, there's, there are particular situations that, that, that uh, form fertile grounds for, for, uh, for, for conspiracy theories. When there is a conspicuous lack of information, then conspiracy theories flower. And so there, there is a conspicuous lack of information in this case. Uh, what was actually one of the sort of investigative, or one of the reporting uh, discoveries that I made while uh, re researching this book was the role that the internet can play, and this seems obvious, right, but the role that the internet can play in, uh, uh, in forging conspiracy theories. Because the experience of talking to people in, uh, literally from Las Vegas to Boston to New York to Tokmok, Kyrgyzstan, uh, and Makhachkala, uh, Dagestan, Grozny, Chechnya, Moscow. And at a certain point, there's a switch that goes on, and these people start saying the exact same words that have come to them uh, courtesy of the internet that form the particular conspiracy theories that they subscribe to. And um, I, uh, I do spend a long time sort of trying to debunk these consp conspiracy theories. And most of them are eminently debunkable. Uh, but they're too, uh, they do expose two huge voids in, uh, in the story about the bombing. One has to do with where the bombs were made. So uh, the FBI, and, and later I, f I finished the book just as the trial was getting underway. Later in the trial, the FBI testified that they didn't know where the bombs were made. They weren't made in Jahar's, the younger brother's dorm room, and they weren't made in Tom Erland's apartment in Cambridge, they were made somewhere else. So if they were made somewhere else, then someone else was involved, right? That person could have been unwittingly involved, that could have, could have been somebody who rented Tom Erland a garage space, right? Uh, or it could have been an accomplice. And we still don't know. Uh, there are a lot of weird questions about the bombs because not only were they made, uh, we don't know where, but they were also made super fast. Uh, they started buying the supplies for the bombs at the end of February. They had built at least seven bombs by the time they, uh, they set them off, they set two of them off at the Boston Marathon on April 15th. According to the FBI's story, they, uh, uh, they, got the, they harvested the gunpowder for the bombs from firecrackers. Well, uh, one person Andrew told me that it would, would have taken 714,000 hours <laughs> to harvest the, the gunpowder. Now, this friend of mine, whom I mentioned, at one point she started messaging me, you have to try to build a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm like, I don't think you should be messaging me this. <laughs> uh, he said, no, no, seriously, because they say that they build a bomb according to this online recipe called build a bomb in the kitchen of your mom, but you have to test whether this is possible. Could you please shut up? <laughs> and uh, this is not something that, you know, obviously if, if, if this is somebody who calls me up and tells me to drop everything, and I drop everything and start writing this book, uh, she's used to being hurt, so she was not going to have any of this, uh, you know, shut up business. And, uh, 
Uh, soon after that, I began to be randomly uh, picked out for explosives checks every time I traveled. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so I, 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 I considered this for about 15 minutes <laughs> because that would be the only way to test this. Because the FBI was testifying, uh, look, it's, it's difficult, but it's, they could have done it. Just following the instructions, uh, they could have built bombs. So the only way really to test it would have been to, to, to build a bomb, and a good reporter would have done that. Um, uh, but um, I'm not that good a reporter, so I... I uh, Immersive I journalism, to, right? You know. Well, the, the, I mean, you have to conduct experiments. Yeah, uh, right. So, so I don't know if this was a prohibitively complicated project uh, or it, if it should have taken them longer than the investigation says it, uh, it, it should have. But certainly there is the issue of the location. The other question uh, that, that is a huge question mark is what was Tarman Lan's relationship with the FBI, right? So in uh, April 2011, uh, the FSB, the Russian secret police, alerted the FBI to Tarman Lan as a potential terrorism risk. Now, the FBI treats these kinds of alerts with a grain of salt, with good reason. They're convinced that the FSB basically just picks out any urban Muslim man and identifies as a terrorism suspect, which is exactly right. That's exactly what they do. Uh, but nonetheless, after the alert, the FBI sent out a field agent at least twice, according to some sorts, three times, to, Tamer, uh, to interview Tamerlan. Uh, and there's a good reason for that as well. Uh, Tamerlan fits the FBI's informant profile perfectly. He is uh, he's Muslim, he's immigrant, so immigrant, which means that he doesn't have a citizenship yet. So the FBI had a lot of leverage. Uh, he is part of the Muslim community, but he was not well integrated into it because there were very, very few Chechens in, in the Boston area. He was perceived as a foreigner, even by the Boston area Muslims. This is exactly the kind, he's bilingual, uh, exactly the kind of person that the FBI normally goes after, which is probably a perfectly sound policy, right? And furthermore, we know that the FBI tried to, to recruit him. The defense has stipulated this, and my sources have all told me this. Uh, and then, less than two years later, he manages to build a bomb, or seven bombs, under what should be uh, the view of the FBI, he is identified as a terrorism risk, and set them off at the largest public gathering in Boston. And then, for days, the FBI, even though they have picked the suspects uh, uh, out from surveillance tapes within hours of the bombing, then the FBI can't identify him, or supposedly can't identify him. So that, 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 that's weird. If it speaks to incompetence, it speaks to incredible incompetence. Actually, I find it credible, but it's still remarkable. <laughs> but but, uh, uh, but that's, it's, 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 uh, it's obvious where the, the questions would arise. During the trial, uh, and that, uh, that's not in the, in the book, it will be in the paperback edition. Uh, during the trial, it also became clear, but the defense wouldn't question this, uh, wouldn't interrogate this. Uh, it also became clear that somebody was trying to recruit Jahar. Very, a very short time before the bombings, because uh, there was a text message exchange where somebody is really trying to recruit him. And incredibly, uh, the FBI showed this uh, uh, for a, com a completely different reason. But I just, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing on the screen, what the other person was saying. They were sort of saying, you know, this jihad thing sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And our are saying, uh, would you just shut up? A little bit like my conversation with my friend about the bomb building. Um, the defense decided not to interrogate that. The defense actually uh, had a, a basic strategy of not alienating the prosecution uh, for fear of alienating the jury. The strategy, as we know, didn't work. It was probably the only possible strategy, but it, it still didn't work uh, in averting the death penalty. But uh, the thing about the American justice system is that it's not part of the, its goal to establish the truth. It, it's uh, like France has a justice system that, uh, that, that is designed to, it's called the inquisitory system, and the judge can summon people mm -hmm. and interrogate them. That's not what happens in an American court. In an American court, guilt is apportioned and punishment is, is, is muted out. It was not in the defense's interest to question the FBI story so nobody questioned the FBI story. 
but it's also not their job to question the FBI story. It is civilian oversight agencies' job to question the, oversight story, uh, the, the FBI story. That's what we had after 9-11. You know, we had the amazing 9-11 Commission report mm -hmm. uh, that, that sort of blew that story wide open. After the Boston bombing, there was a congressional committee that traveled to, uh, to Russia for a few days. The high point, uh, or the low point, of their trip was a press conference at the U.S. Embassy hosted by Steven Siegel. Steven, yes, Steven Siegel, the action American, star yeah. who now works uh, as a PR flag for the Chechen government. And when this congressional committee got back to the states, they issued a report that contained less information that was at that time publicly available in the media. Uh, in, the, in the report, they did complain that the FBI wasn't very forthcoming with information. Uh, but if, that, if, if they're asleep at the wheel, there's no way to hold the FBI accountable. Well, I mean, it is your job in a way to establish truth, right, or to try and understand what the truth is to the extent that you can. And I wanted to ask you, you talked about early on going to Dagestan, Kyrgyzstan, Moscow to report this book. You spent a lot of time going in and out of the country. This is a country that you, in your lifetime, have had to leave twice. You know, once as a teenager with your family, and then not that long ago, what, a year and a half ago, right. as an adult with your wife and children. Um, what, what were the risks of doing that, and how did you manage them? Um, I actually was still living in Russia when I started reporting this book. Uh, and I still, I still, I still go there uh, to report. The, we had to leave uh, almost two years ago because the government was basically threatening to take away our kids. Uh, and the point of that was to drive us out of the country, which succeeded. Uh, it, um, so I have, yes, I have the very strange distinction of having emigrated once as a Jew and, and once as a lesbian. It doesn't feel very different, the, sort of the, the, yeah. the anti-Semitism that drove us out the first time and the anti-gay campaign that drove us out the second time. It kind of smells mm -hmm. and, uh, and feels the same. Mm -hmm. Was it... Was it challenging when you go back to the country? Is it dangerous for you? I mean, you I talked about, talk about that. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about Russia. I was reading a column that you wrote. Um, it was a, a prank played on Elton John, sir, <laughs> Elton John, by these two hosts of a, an official Russian television station called pretending to be Vladimir Putin right. and his press flag. Mm -hmm. And um, you wrote, you know, people were like, how could anybody follow, fall for something like that, as Elton John did? And you said, well, try imagining the way the world looks from Moscow, and it will all make sense. So, um, uh, Elton John had, uh, had gone to Kiev a week before, and had actually met with the president, and then had said that he would like to meet with uh, Putin as well and talk LGBT rights. And then he posted on his Instagram that Putin had called him and invited him for a meeting uh, to, to, um, to discuss LGBT rights. Now, the, uh, nobody, uh, some people immediately thought it was a prank. Uh, Elton John obviously didn't. I didn't think it was a prank because exactly two years earlier, my phone had rung, and someone had said that he was Vladimir Putin, and I thought it was a prank. <laughs> but it turned out to be not a prank. <laughs> so he wanted me to come in and discuss uh, his nature conservation efforts with him, which actually happened. So, uh, and his first sentence was, I like kitties and puppies and little animals, <laughs> which was which was supposed to establish his, his, his bona fides as a nature conservationist. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I thought, well, this makes perfect sense to me. Uh, and, uh, and Elton John is clearly smarter than I was because when Putin called me, I, uh, you know, I knew it was a prank. So I, I thought, um, if, I, if this is going to be on YouTube, so how am I going to respond in a way that will make me sound good on YouTube? <laughs> and, uh, 
and he just kept going, and I thought, oh, this guy is really good. <laughs> uh, he does such a great impersonation, not just voice, but just the, the style and the way of talking. And I, you know, I'd spent, uh, I had, this was six months after I published a book about Putin, so I spent years inside this man's head. And, um, and there was somebody who had clearly done the same thing. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and then, um, so then I thought, you know, the Elton John, obviously, uh, believes the things that, that make perfect sense because Putin was trying to reassert himself as a negotiating partner for the United States uh, uh, on the eve of coming to New York to, uh, to speak at the, General, uh, the UN General Assembly. So he had pulled back in Ukraine a bit, and so it would make sense for him to show that he was pulling back on the anti-gay campaign a bit as well. Because what has made him an international pariah is Ukraine and the anti-gay campaign. So how was he going to demonstrate that? That's a very tricky thing to do. And obviously calling Elton John is a perfectly logical thing to do. So I was convinced that this was real. And I said to people, you know, uh, if, if I were a prankster and I impersonated Putin and was, uh, were resourceful enough to get Elton John's direct line, then I would have put, put this on YouTube by now. So the fact that it's not on YouTube means that it was real. Well, a day later they put it on YouTube. <laughs> so, I had to recast that column to say you know, it could happen. And then, and then Putin called Elton John. <laughs> um, which uh, at that point, I thought when somebody first mentioned it to me, uh, I thought they were referring to the, the, not, the prank call of a week earlier, but it was actually the real call uh, that, that happened um, after the whole discussion of the prank. And this somehow embodies Moscow in this moment. I think it, it does. Sort of the, uh, there's, there's a book by Peter Pomerantsev uh, on Russian propaganda called Nothing is True and anything, Everything is Possible, which I think is an excellent summing up of, 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 of what Moscow feels and acts like these days. I'm curious, you know, I mean, you've written, as you said, about Vladimir Putin. You're writing, you're working on another book about him. Um, you spent years inside his head. Um, but when you first came to the United States, you know, not Putin, but Russia was sort of the evil empire. This is like 1981, we have Reagan's the evil empire. Um, what did you make of all that, coming to the United States as a teenager with that image of Russia circulating? How did you, were you like? Yes. That's, that's exactly what it's Yes. Like. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I landed in a uh, lovely liberal suburb of Boston, and I was 14 years old. Uh, so, so actually, I was in this sort of double uh, or, or circular exercise of engaging with these great liberal Jewish suburban Boston kids. Uh, who, who all were trying to draft me as an ally in debunking the whole evil empire idea. And, um, and I feel like I've been having the same argument for 34 years now, uh, which is that uh, the, the, ba the basic argument to, uh, to the evil empire rhetoric, uh, the, the basic response is you can't call a whole country an evil empire because that damns the whole people. It's, it's, it's culture shaming. And, uh, and, and, and now I feel like, uh, I, I feel like I've been do, doing all this work and growing so much over the 34 years, but really in this way I haven't advanced at all. Because the basic argument against that is, look, uh, first of all, some cultures deserve to be shamed. Uh, and second of all, the idea that you can't condemn a population when you're condemning a state is a fundamentally democratic idea. And there's a, failure, there's a built in failure of imagination in that statement, right? Uh, because you can't imagine a, a country in which the population has zero agency, none, right? That's what a totalitarian state, a totalitarian state is like. A totalitarian country is equal to its state, unlike a democratic country, which is not equal to its government. Uh, and, um, and so in that sense, evil empire is actually a very accurate term. As long as Russia, Russian people have no agency, as long as, um, and by no agency, I don't mean that they have deeply held beliefs 
that they have no mechanism for communicating to, to the government or that they have no way of influencing the government. What I mean is that totalitarianism is different, and this is, I'm quoting Hannah Arendt now, uh, who says that totalitarianism is different from tyranny in that tyranny dominates and forces people into, uh, forces behaviors and opinions onto people. But totalitarianism robs people of the very ability to form opinions, right? So a totalitarian state is not totalitarian because it controls every aspect of life. It's totalitarian because it's a totality, because it is all one. And, um, and that was definitely true of the Soviet Union in 1981. And it is increasingly becoming true of Russia today. Well, I want to talk more about your forthcoming book, but I also want to give everyone here an opportunity. Uh, can you hear me? <laughs> I've been the only one talking this whole time? <laughs> Just to myself. Um, Sorry about that, folks. Um, so I, let's take some questions. I would just ask you in advance, I'm sure many of you have questions for Masha, so try and keep your questions as short and to the point as possible so we can get through a number of them. Yeah, we seem to have a microphone. We'll be coming around myself and Hannah with the mics, and I'll take the first question right here. Thank you, Marsha, it's very nice. Uh, I, I agree with uh, you profiling the terrorist, you know, in an immigrant country, but as a common citizen, how, what is my role or somebody else's role to prevent anybody from becoming a terrorist? I'm not saying like, if I see something, then call FBI, I'm not talking about that. Just, you know, what is, as a society, what's our role for, you know? making more terrorist, especially in America. That's what my question is. So uh, there have been, uh, if, we, if we talk about, uh, if we use uh, a fairly narrow definition of terrorism, uh, uh, there have been two terrorist attacks in the United States in the last 15 years. Uh, one of them took a lot of lives. The other one, the Boston, terror, the Boston bombing, took three lives. Uh, the damage done by them is less than uh, the damage done by, you know, the, the, the injuries and, uh, and, and deaths of, um, in traffic accidents or of pedestrians or, uh, you know, uh, most of these years people dying from having their uh, uh, flat screen television fall on them. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, I, and I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to say that an act of terrorism is not a big deal. An act of terrorism is tragic, and it does have far-reaching consequences, and they are much for, for more far-reaching than the particular uh, uh, deaths and injuries that are, uh, uh, that are inflicted. But the risk of terrorism is vanishingly small. Uh, so uh, that's not a direct answer to your question, but I think it's the best answer to your question. We'll take our next question. Test. Test. We'll take our next question right here. So since you wrote book about Putin, uh, he called you and you basically have him in your head. How you interpret his last activity in Syria? And do you think whatever his goal is, he will succeed again? Uh, that's a great question. So he's... Um, what I think he's doing with Syria is uh, he, he is, uh, and, he, and he comes right out and says this, uh, he's trying to reestablish Russia as a superpower and as, a, as, as, as the negotiating partner with the United States in a bilateral world. He thinks he has, uh, first of all, he has the nukes to do this. Nuclear par parity is extremely important to him. It's something that we don't talk about a lot about in this country, but it's something that's in Putin's head all the time, especially in the last couple of years. Uh, Syria is the perfect place to play this out because he had his, the high point, uh, the, the absolute high point of his entire 16 years in office so far actually came in September 2013 when he hijacked Syria. When Barack Obama was, was fumbling, couldn't get congressional support for an intervention, and then Putin swooped in 
and said, I'm going to negotiate chemical uh, disarmament in Syria. Uh, he had an op-ed in the New York Times that was brilliant in using American rhetoric against the United States and calling out American exceptionalism, just gorgeous, uh, and American disregard for international law. This is a country that less than six months later would, would annex, uh, would, would, would carry out the first forcible annexation of land in post-World uh, post War II Europe, calling out the United States for disregard for international law. And um, Putin can't quite wrap his mind around the fact that in just two years, he went from that, from being on top of the world, to being an international pariah. So Syria is supposed to, uh, his intervention in Syria is supposed to, A, reestablish him as this world figure, B, write off everything that's happened in the last two years. So that's why when he was speaking at the General Assembly, he said this could be like our, uh, we need to have talks on Syria, and this will be like our Yalta. And of course, Yalta allowed the Soviet Union to write off all the annexations of land that it had carried out while it was allied with Nazi Germany. And it divided the world into two parts. So that's the deal that he's proposing. And three, he's using Syria as a, uh, a, show, a showcase of Russian military might. And in that, he's extraordinarily successful. Uh, you know, the military analysts all over the West are writing, wow, they're in much better shape than we thought. Uh, and he's really, he's really putting his best military foot forward there to, to show just that. Any other questions? The next question right here. Do you think there's a difference in culpability between the two brothers? And if so, do you think that uh, that should be reflected in the punishment? Uh, absolutely, there's a difference of culpability. And, uh, uh, the defense's line during the trial was that it wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for, for the older brother, and that, uh, that the beliefs that led to the, uh, to the bombing were Tamerlan's, the older brother's, and not Jahar's. I think part A of that statement is true. It wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for the older brother, which is true not just of this crime, but pretty much of any crime, and this is, it's a whole category of crime, right? C crimes carried out by older, younger brother pairs. It's a fairly common phenomenon. They're usually led by the older brother, and they wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been but for the older brother, right? There's nothing so extraordinary about this particular pairing. Uh, as for the beliefs, it's not true. The beliefs were shared, they were very much Jahar's own, uh, but as Scott Adrian points out, as in other cases, uh, they were not deeply held. These beliefs are not essential to the act of terrorism. Uh, rad having radical beliefs is actually not a predictor of terrorism. Most people who have radical beliefs don't set off bombs. Even most people who have radical beliefs that support violence don't set off bombs. It's a different behavior. It's a different phenomenon. So. Um, uh, so I think that you know the defense was 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 buying into the whole radicalization narrative, and uh, in in saying that, I think if Tamerlan had lived, they would have had a much better chance of making the argument that one should get a harsher punishment than the other one not. Uh, Jahar certainly stood trial for the both of them. Uh, as for whether it should have been reflected in punishment, I mean, I I I, I don't believe in the death penalty. So I don't think he should have gotten the death penalty. Next question. Uh, regarding your um, uh, research on terrorism, what's your perspective on using military force to defeat terrorism? Uh, <laughs> well, so, so the war on terror is, this, is, is the strangest war ever fought, probably, uh, because uh, and again, this is, I didn't make up this phrase, this is Louise Richardson, who's a great terrorism researcher, uh, has written, how do you wage a war against an emotion? Uh, now, uh, there's a, and it's not just a rhetorical issue, it's a strategic issue. A war should have an objective. When is this war won? When we no longer experience terror? When we no longer experience terrorism? Well, in that case, that war was won a long time ago. There was no terrorism in this country 
for uh, 12 years. Or when American citizens are not the potential, the targets of terrorism anywhere else in the world, okay, that's more complicated, uh, or potential targets of terrorism, it's impossible to place an objective on this war. Uh, and for those reasons, primarily, I'm opposed to using military force. Because you, you should never, you, a country should never use military force when it doesn't know what it's using military force for. Next question over here. Your, your definition of terrorism seems very well suited, unfortunately, for today's times. But there have been many acts of terrorism done in the name of building nation states or opposing nation states or of, uh, in general, uh, larger political movements. And I wonder if you could draw a connection between what you define now as terrorism and some of those other types of acts of terror that have been replete in our history. Right. So terrorism, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, like all the uh, terms that describe our political reality, if you start digging a little bit, you realize that there's no single definition of terrorism. Most experts agree that a terrorism has to be carried out, uh, is carried out by a non-state actor. So I think that the, the, sort of the whole conversation about state terrorism is rather misguided. Uh, uh, they also agree that terrorism, uh, terrorist attacks are uh, aimed at non-state actors, right? So if you are a person with a bomb attacking a military base, you're probably not a terrorist. Uh, in some way, and that actually, uh, there have been some terrorism prosecutions in this country that don't fit that definition. Uh, uh, there was uh, the Newburgh Four who were accused of plotting to fire a missile at a, a military base in New York State. Uh, they also usually agree that uh, the goal of terrorism is to create, to draw attention to a political cause. So in that sense, I think the equal sign that some people have proposed to draw between, say, high school shooters and terrorists, it's, it's probably not exactly accurate. It may be useful for some, uh, for certainly in making the argument for, for prosecuting these crimes in similar ways. I think it's very useful. Uh, but technically or, or rhetorically, it's probably not very accurate. And then a, a, a fourth part, a part of the definition is that it affects, it, it, its aim is not to kill the maximum number of people, but to affect the maximum number of people by spreading terror. Right. Uh, so yes, that, uh, uh, that, that certainly has, uh, fits not just uh, what we have come to call Islamic terrorism, but also uh, acts of terror carried out throughout the 20th century and late 19th century, which is where sort of the history of, traditionally the history of modern terrorism uh, is tra traced back to, to the late 19th century. And um, uh, it, it, attacks carried out by individuals or small groups against the rep uh, people that they saw as representative of the regime, but not the regime itself. We'll take our last question over here. Uh, are you still following the Pussy Riot Girls? And are they, do they continue to be persecuted? Uh, I, we stay in occasional contact. Uh, we're, we're not really friends because uh, they're actually young enough to be my children, but... Uh, <laughs> But we see each other when we're in the same country. Uh, and um, they have become, uh, well, two of them who served out their, their sentences, uh, uh, Maria and, and Nadezhda, they've become these incredible activists. They emerged from prison as prisoners' rights activists. So they've uh, they formed an organization that's, uh, that, that's aimed at prison reform and at helping, helping inmates. I think they've been much more successful with the latter than with the former, which makes sense. I mean, there can be no reform in Russia in any field until there is regime change. But what they do is, uh, and what, they, what, they, what they've done a very good job doing is, is um, getting information about individual, uh, uh, individual inmates whose rights are being abused 
and getting enough attention, mobilizing enough effort uh, around those cases to save individual lives, literally. That's a huge thing that they're accomplishing. Uh, and um, they've been able to travel around the world. I also love something that they're doing, uh, which is that everywhere they go, they meet with local activists and they make a point of talking not just about the issues that they bring from Russia, but the issues that they learn about locally. So uh, if it's a small group, they will actually turn the tables and start interviewing the audience and asking, you know, what are prisoners' rights uh, like in your country? What should we be talking about? And the next time they, talk, they go on stage, they talk about local issues. They're pretty amazing. Yeah. And to that point you just made about there won't be any reform in Russia until there's regime change. I mean, do you, do you have, hold out hopes for something like that happening as you're writing this, this next book on Vladimir Putin? Well, uh, the system that Putin has built, which is a closed system, will eventually implode. It's just, it's a fact. Uh, closed systems eventually implode. I don't hold out a lot of hope for how soon it may happen, although we don't know. It's a closed system. That's, again, that's the point, right? So it could happen in a year or two. It could happen in 20 years. Uh, I'm rather inclined to think it will take longer than, uh, the, 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 longer, but I don't know. But um, the longer what is going on in Russia today goes on, the worse things will be when it finally implodes. The more damage will have been done to the fabric of society. The more damage will have been done to, to the people. Mm -hmm. uh, and the worst things will be, I, I, I'm very pessimistic about what will happen when it implodes, even if it happens soon. But if it happens 10, 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, it will be an absolute catastrophe. Well, on I hate to end on that note, <laughs> but this is the end. Thank you, Matthew.